yourself. And be yourself, yes, right. yes. So, so, so please. please. Yes. So first of all, I mean, we should start uh, with some pending question, maybe, that something that was not clear in the last four lectures. Not so much. Okay. So, <clears throat> today I want essentially to cover two different topics, briefly, okay, because we don't have so much time. So the first one will be, let's say, uh, an approach to the hierarchy problem using extra dimension. So you will have some dedicated lectures only on general relativity and, and extra dimension starting this afternoon. I think. Uh, so I, will, I won't give all the details, but I will really focus on, on the physics. In particular, <coughs> I want to give you a feeling of this ADS-CFT correspondence and how we can use it actually to, um, to build some model for instance that could uh, be useful to understand this composite X model or this X less model and the technical or etc. And then in the second part of the lecture we'll discuss briefly this relaxion model which is you know, the interplay between the X physics and axion <coughs> and using the cosmological evolution of the universe to actually solve or address the hierarchy problem. So, let me start with extra dimension. So, and I will give you uh, two ideas how to solve the yard problem using extra dimension. So, the first idea uh, is what is called a um, large extra dimension for Arcadia Medi Monculos and Valley uh, scenario. So, those extra dimension are just flat extra dimension. They are just extra dimension space and extra dimension. And there are particular extra dimension in the sense that it's only gravity that can propagate into those extra dimension, while all the gauge interaction will be localized on a four-dimensional uh, slice of this um, extra dimensional wall. And the second approach is, uh, is rather different because it's really using um, some huge gravitational effect, some huge curvature um, in extra dimension. So at the end of the day, we will end up into anti density space, which are maximally symmetric space due to a you know, cosmological constant that curve the extra dimension. And you will see that you know, this gravitational effect on the extra dimension has some uh, important implication for four-dimensional physics. So, I mean, at the end of the day, the, the idea of large extra dimension is quite simple. It's simply saying that you know, we have, let's say, n extra dimension. So you write simply the Einstein action in this 4 plus n extra dimension. So that's something that you should use, you should be used to now. So this is just a determinant of the metric. Then you have the, uh, the Ricci and scalar, 4 plus n right, dimension. And then you need to, to normalize this action to the Planck scale, let's say, in 4 plus n dimension. And dimensionally, this as a, you need to, to put the power of the Planck scale to the 2 plus m. Right? So in four dimension, you would simply put the Planck scale square, and if you have n extra dimension, it will be an m star, which is a scale of quantum gravity, let's say, in 2 plus m, to the power of 2 plus m. So now we are asking ourselves, so this is a, you know, the extra dimension action, and we want to compactify, let's say, this uh, sum of this extra dimension, and write the effective action for the four-dimensional world. Right? So ourselves, we are living in four dimension. Right? So we don't have a direct access to those extra dimension. So you can really integrate them out. Like, you know, for instance, in, in four firm interaction, we integrate out the W. So we just assume that the W, you don't have enough energy to excite this, this W. So you can just replace the W by its equation of motion. So here is the same thing. You want to integrate out uh, the volume of this extra dimension. So in this case, you know, if you assume indeed that the extra dimension are flat, the metric is quite simple, right? It will be simply uh, the four-dimensional metric, g mu nu, dx mu, dx nu. Right? But you have the usual four-dimensional uh, wall with its own metric that depends on x only. And then you can assume that you know you have something like a sphere of radius r, r squared, d, y, n squared. Right? So it means that you have n extra dimension, which are just a sphere. 
So in this case, you know, it's relatively easy to integrate this extra dimension, integrate those extra dimension, it will be simply integral over d for x. So the metric becomes the determinant of the metric becomes simply the determinant of the metric here, and then you end up uh, with a uh, with a Ricci scalar in four dimension, m star d two plus n, and then you end up only with the volume of those extra dimensions, and by by dimension, you know, you can see that it's simply r to the n, which corresponds up to let's say to some angular um, volume. But this is just a, the dimension of this from the volume of this space. So now from this equation, you can simply understand that the Planck scale viewed from the four-dimensional wall will be simply equal to this product of the gravitational quantum gravity scale in four plus n dimension times the volume of this extra dimension. So this is m Planck in 4D squared. Right? So now you're asking yourself, can I lower actually the fundamental scale of quantum gravity in this extra dimension and still get M Planck of the order of 10 to the 19 GeV, right? So that's what you know experimentally, right? You know that the Planck scale in four dimensions has to be 10 to the 19 GeV. But it doesn't mean necessarily that the scale of quantum gravity in extra dimension has to be of the order of M Planck. In particular, you know, if there is a big hierarchy between, let's say, the radius, the size of this extra dimension in unit of the Planck scale in, in extra dimension, mm -hmm. then you can get actually M Planck, which is much lo uh, much larger than the fundamental scale of quantum gravity in this four plus N dimension. So now we are going to play with this simple relation. M Planck squared is equal to M star the two plus N R to the N. And the idea of you know, solving the hierarchy problem is simply to say that the higher scale that you have in your fundamental, fundamental theory should be of the order of one TV. In this case, you have no hierarchy problem because you know, the higher scale that you can reach in your loops will always be uh, screened at, uh, by the scale of the fundamental theory. So what you want to achieve, let's say, to address the hierarchy problem is to push M star to be one TV. So now you have everything. You know M Planck in four dimension. You, you try to really push M star to one TV, and the only thing that you're asking yourself is what is the value of the size of this extra dimension? So here you can solve it. Right? Simply R is equal to M M Planck of M star to the power minus N plus 2 over N times M Planck minus 1. Okay. So now we want to put the numbers, right? So M Planck minus 1 is equal to, do you know, to translate um, this in the size, what is the value of M Planck in, uh, in length? One thing that you have to remember. Right? N to minus 33 centimeters. That's the Planck length, right? <clears throat> so now you're asking yourself, okay, so now you can solve this equation. Let's say you assume that there is only one extra dimension, right? So in this case, M Planck 10 to the 19 divided by 1 TV, so it's 10 to the, six, 10 to the uh, 16 to the power, which is 10 to the 16 to the power 
um, minus 3, minus 3 times 10 to minus 33 centimeter. And this should be uh, 38, 10 to the 15 centimeter. So with one single extra dimension, you know, you can lower the scale of quantum gravity to one TV, provided that the size of this extra dimension is of the order of 10 to the 15 centimeter. So we don't know much about gravity. We don't know exactly the, the behavior of gravity at short distances, but certainly we have tested you know, gravity at distances uh, which are lower and uh, smaller than 10 to the 15. And what we, have, what we know from gravity, from the Newton law, is that the behavior of gravitational interaction is 1 over r squared for, for distances that are macroscopic. So this means that if the, the behavior of Newton law is 1 over r squared, it really means that the graviton propagates in 4 dimensions and not in 5 dimensions. So this means that you certainly cannot have an extra dimension which is that large. But this is excluded by what we know as gravity. Okay, so this doesn't work. So now you can repeat this exercise for n equal 2. Okay. So n equal 2 is 10 to the 16. Uh, 2 plus 2 is 4 divided by 2. Okay. n to minus 33 centimeter. So it's 32 minus 33, so in this case, is 10 to minus 1 centimeter. And now we are in business, actually. <coughs> because nobody has really tested gravity, you know, the behavior of the Newton laws, at distances of that size. Mm -hmm. So it's perfectly allowed, you know, to modify Newton law at distances below 1 millimeter, actually. Well, nowadays, the current experimental constraint is more of the order of 100 microns. So we don't know exactly how the Newton law behaves at distances short, shorter than one, 100 micron. So this means that you know, it's perfectly allowed to have um, two extra dimensions of the order of one millimeter, 100 micron. I mean, here we couldn't put all the numerical factors. So one millimeter is also equal to 100 micron. It's the same thing. So it's perfectly allowed, indeed, to have a behavior of the gravitational interaction you know, as a function of the distances, the distances minus 1. So here you have, let's say, 100 micron minus 1, right? So for distances that are um, larger than this, so here you have a behavior like 1 over r squared. And for shorter distances, you will have a behavior which is 1 over r to the fourth due to the existence of the two extra dimensions, so the graviton can propagate into those two extra dimensions, and then, just by uh, the Gauss law, the Gauss law, the behavior of the gravitational interaction will be 1 over r to the 4. So experimentally, this is perfectly uh, compatible with what we know of gravity. And then you have achieved what you wanted, you know, because really the scale of quantum gravity in this case is 1t. So, I mean, we can argue, you know, whether or not this is really a solution of the hierarchy problem, because at the end of the day, you know, we have replaced the hierarchy here between the two scales, the scale of quantum gravity in six dimension and the scale of quantum gravity in four dimension. So this is a huge hierarchy. And we have simply translated this hierarchy into a hierarchy between m star and r minus one, right? So this is one TV. And here, r star minus 1 is of the order of uh, 10 to minus 1 centimeter minus 1. Yeah. And this is, of course, much uh, smaller than 1 TV. So we have simply reformulated, let's say, the hierarchy problem in terms of uh, geometry. And I don't, I'm sure you will hear more about that in, in, the, next, in the next lecture. But that is give an interesting phenomenology. Interesting phenomenology because really, you know, here all the gravitational interactions are really localized on the brain in 4D, four-dimensional slice of this extra dimension. 
And the only thing that are allowed to propagate into the X-ray dimension are some graviton. And also what, what is called the Kaluza Klein excitation of the graviton, um, which is just um, this is a Fourier excitation of, of the massless graviton that can propagate along this X-ray dimension. So in particular, you know, you can have processes where the four-dimensional field will decay into graviton that escape into this extra dimension. So you have missing energy that goes away from, uh, from your experiment, from your colliders. So there is a rich phenomenology associated to this. And of course, I mean, one important aspect of this model is that somehow you will have some quantum gravitational effect at a scale of order 1 TV. So that was, you know, all the, the question at the beginning of the NHC this case, whether you will be able to produce, for instance, black holes, simply because you will, you will collide proton with an energy above one, um, one TV, and you will have expected the production of black holes in this kind of scenario. So you don't have to really uh, wait to reach 10 to the 19 uh, GV to produce these black holes in your colliders. That's a very exciting uh, signature. There are also, of course, astrophysical constraints, you know, in this scenario, in particular, the cooling of, uh, of some supernova. So supernova can emit some, uh, some, some graviton in, in the extra dimension and lose energy in that way. And this, there are some constraints on this kind of phenomenon. Actually, this put uh, the strongest bound on this kind of scenario. Okay, so that's just ADD, which is called ADD, right? It was proposed by those people, Arkady Ahmed, uh, Dimopoulos, and Bali, I think in 1998. So, the second use of extra dimension is slightly different, because here, so all the extra dimension were kind of trivial, you know, it was totally flat, so you were not really using um, all the richness of the gravity in extra dimension, only flat space. So what you're doing is simply you're diluting the strength of gravity by allowing the, the gravity to propagate into the extra dimension. So that's why it sounds that the, the strength of gravity is so much weaker compared to the, to the, uh, to the gauge interaction, simply because you know, the gauge field are confined in the brain, when really the gravity can propagate into the extra dimension, so there is some, uh, some some volume effects and they lose some strength just because they, they explore the full, the full space. So the other model, which is called Randall Sundrum, use a different approach and really rely on, on some gravitational effect on this extra dimension. So at the end of the day, it's simply a solution of Einstein equation in five dimensions. So the x5, square root of g, and Planck phi the cube, and in presence of a negative cosmological constant. So there is vacuum energy that, that, that is there in, in, in five dimensions. So you have a cosmological constant. This cosmological constant is negative, and this curve is a space. Right? So you can solve this Einstein equation. So hopefully we will hear more about uh, the GR and Einstein equation in the next lecture. And the Einstein equation, so that's just the equivalent of the, of the Minkowski metric, of the Minkowski background, you know, in presence of this negative cosmological constant, is simply this anti Sitter space. And you can write the metric like this. Dx4 minus dz squared. And r, r is just the radius of ADS, so ADS radius. And this is related to lambda phi simply by, uh, by the Einstein equation. If you want, I can give you an um, exact relation, maybe. It was in the, in the exercises. It was one of the exercises to compute really this radius of ADS in terms of, uh, of lambda phi. Yeah. So what you notice is that here the space is what is called conformally flat. In particular, you know the four-dimensional world is perfectly flat up to simply this vile, uh, this vile factor right? that depends on, on the position along the extra dimension. So this means that for you, 
who's living in four dimensions, you know, you will see everything which is perfectly Lorentz invariant. Right? There is no breaking of Lorentz invariant. We live the four dimensional world with like four dimensional Lorentz invariant. Lorentz invariant. So the space is the following. So you have two boundaries to this space. One boundary at z equal r. So in such a way that on this on this boundary, you know, the metric is just normalized to, to one, so it's just flat space. And then you have the other side of the wall at z equal r prime, where basically the metric is in a, <coughs> is easily um, suppressed, yes. So r prime would be actually much larger than r, in such a way that this is a small factor. <coughs> so in which sense uh, this metric uh, can address actually the hierarchy problem? Well, you will assume, for instance, that in this case, the x is confined close to this boundary. So the x will be living close to this side of the universe. Right? So what is the action that you're going to write for the x field in this case? Right? So you're simply writing an action on this boundary. So we just take the limit where the x field will live on the boundary and nothing else. So you have g4 <coughs> times the usual kinetic term, e mu e phi, e mu phi, squared, um, times the, the potential. Okay, the potential for the x minus phi squared minus b squared. Okay. Yeah, I don't care about the factor 2, the normalization, etc. It doesn't matter. So that's <coughs> the action that you will write, right? For, for a field which is localized on, on the boundary. So now, I mean, the only scale that you have at your disposal is the scale of quantum gravity, which will be M5, right? So M5 will be also of the order of 1 over R. And that will be, at the end of the day, that will be also of the order of M Planck in four dimensions. Uh, simply because, okay, I'll I, I give you the connection between M5 and M Planck in a moment. But we will end up into this, this regime. <coughs> so this means that, you know, uh, you can really allow all the dimension full parameter in this Lagrangian to take very large value of the order of M Planck of M5. So V will be, as predicted, let's say, by uh, the quantum correction, will be of the order of the higher scale that you have in your problem, which is the scale of quantum gravity. <coughs> so now let, let us look in details about, about this action, in particular when you plug in the metric here. So this action has to be taken at Z equal R prime. So what is this metric in 4D? The determinant of the metric in 4D is simply r to the z to the fourth power, right? The determinant of this metric. So you have four right factors due to, to the fact that the metric on this brain in, is Minkowski up to this value of scale. Right? D mu, d mu, so you have one inverse of the metric, so you have r over z to the minus two. And in this case, you lower and raise the indices with the flat metric, right? Mm -hmm. Eta mu nu, mm -hmm. d mu phi, mm -hmm. d mu phi. Squared. Two metrics. Okay. And for the second term, you don't have this, uh, this extra power of the metric, extra power of the inverse of the metric. So it's phi squared minus v squared. So what you notice here is that this scalar field phi actually is not canonically normalized anymore. Viewed from the four-dimensional Minkowski point of view, this field doesn't have the usual kinetic term. So this means that you need to absorb this extra power of the warp factor or the violet factor in order to make sure that phi is actually a canonically normalized field. So you need that R over R prime to the square to the second power phi squared. You want to define that phi theta squared. Okay. So you will rewrite this metric now as simply d4x 
phi nu phi tilde, phi nu phi tilde, et tan minu. Okay. What about the other term? If you minus, <coughs> so here we have okay, minus r of r prime to the 4, right? lambda phi squared minus v squared squared. And now I want to replace phi by phi tilde. Okay. So we say that phi is phi tilde squared r prime to the r squared minus v squared squared. Right? So you can pull out this extra factor. So this is the real kinetic term minus this the squared will cancel, so it's lambda by tilde squared minus r of r prime squared and b squared. Okay. So this means that for canonically normalized field, as we will interpret in, in usual a uh, four-dimensional Minkowski space, no. this phi tilde has no a dimension full parameter which is not V, which is not M5, but you have V tilde, which is of the order of R over R prime times V. So there is a redshift, if you want, of all the energy scale. So as long as you're moving along the extra dimension, all the energy scale are simply rescaled a redshift by this warp factor. So it's just pure gravitational effect. So you have a huge gravitational potential, like on Earth, so, and then you are reshifting all the scales. And in particular, now you see that you can really achieve that V tilde is of the order of 1 TV, let's say, 100 GV, whatever, even if M star um, is uh, of the order of M5 or M Planck. And for that, you simply need to achieve that R prime is again normalized of the order of 1 TV. It's 1 over M Planck. So you really need to, to go along this ADS phase in this coordinate system from Z equal 1 over M Planck down to Z equal 1 over, 1 over T. So you, you will tell me why well, it seems that you haven't done much, right? Again, you have replaced the hierarchy of scale in terms of uh, you know, an extra dimension. Um, there is some advantages. I mean, we are going to discuss a little bit the, uh, really the, the physics behind this model. Yes. Uh, oh, uh, uh, that is correct what you're saying. All scales should be somehow redshifted. Yes. Uh, there is some delicate point uh, here. Uh, you see, if you if you look on your M5 scale, mm -hmm. yeah. it also should get this redshift, okay. which you didn't talk. So that, uh, that is sort of, so, yeah. you know, confusion. All scales are shifted except M5, but M5 is also shifted. If you can see this, it's yeah. a big position. So, the thing that I haven't explained to you yet is actually this relation. So why M Planck is at the end of the day of, of the order of M5, right? And you can understand that by looking at actually the, the wave function of the graviton. And it turns out that the graviton actually won't be fit on that brain, but okay, it depends a little bit. Um, the localization of the graviton is always a little bit confusing, but you can interpret it as by saying that the graviton wave function is actually localized on the other side of the body, on the, of the ADS space. So effectively, the graviton see a scale which is 1 over M5 and not a TV. So 1 TV is only seen by the field that are living on this boundary. Well, but it depends uh, on observer who, who is looking for. If observer is sitting there or there, that is um, but, uh, okay, maybe not exactly for gravity because okay, gravity mm -hmm. is actually you know is, is filling all the space. So actually, doesn't depend where the particle is is living. You will always see the same gravitational interaction, which be one of M Planck. 
even though you know the graviton effectively is localized on the Planck brain, it will have still the same gravitational interaction with all the particles, irrespectively where this particle is actually moving. Yeah, so that's, that's maybe a subtlety, I don't know if this will be explained. I mean, it will take me a little bit of time you know, to, to derive all this wave function of the, of the graviton and the KK mode, so I, I'm not planning to do that here, but that's, that's a picture, basically, that really gravita gravitational interactions don't suffer from this redshift simply because gravitation you know, fills all the space, so there is no particular point for, for gravity. But yeah, that's, that's indeed the point. Right? That's the crucial point is that, the, let's say, the, the scale will be suppressed on the TV, on the TV brain, or on the R prime infrared brain. This is called sometimes the infrared boundaries, and the other side is called the UV boundary. So here, indeed, the scale are reshifted, but the gravitational interaction remains the same. So now I want to tell you that there is actually a, a, nice, a nice physical um, property associated to this ADS space. Um, for that, I need to discuss briefly you know, some, um, some kanusa klein decomposition. So again, I won't do all, uh, all the computation. This will be done in this uh, lecture devoted to, to, to gravity in an extra dimension. But I will just flash the result and give you the physical interpretation. First, I want to tell you about boundary conditions. Boundary conditions, let's say, for the various fields that live in those extra dimensions. So yesterday, I already told you that you know, it's important, actually, to, uh, to compactify, so to make sure that these extra dimensions have, actually, singularities. So you cannot compactify on smooth manifold, like a, like a torus or sphere, etc. This wouldn't lead to, uh, to, to a current theory in four dimensions. There is no way to generate chirality for the fermion if you compactify it on a smooth manifold. Unless you introduce some, some magnetic flux, etc. But that's too complicated here. So, an example, and some of the simplest example of a uh, you know, manifold with, with singularity is simply an interval. So, you have an interval, and here you have two boundaries, and the boundaries are singular points. Right? So, you could actually see this interval simply as a limit, you know, of a, uh, of a cycle. So you have a cycle, so a cycle is just the identification of the coordinate along the extra dimension. You are just making sure that y is equal to y plus 2 pi r. So S1, so the cycle, is simply the real axis modulo this identification, so modulo this translation of invariance. So that's just a, a cycle of E or torus, right? And you generalize this notion to more than one extra dimension, and this gives you a torus. So now the orbifold is simply a cycle where you will also identify the point minus y with the point y. Right? So you are making this identification y with minus y. And then you end up with what is called the orbifold, S1 mod Z2. Z2 because this is a Z2, uh, Z2 symmetry. And here, clearly, then the fundamental uh, space of this orbifold is simply an half of the cycles. So you have two boundaries, these two boundaries, the two fixed points of this uh, Z2 symmetry. And if there are two fixed points, clearly, zero, you know, zero is equivalent to zero. Right? So the point is left invariant by, by Z2. And the point pi over r is also left invariant by this Z2 symmetry because pi over r is identified to minus pi over r by Z2. And then you do a translation of 2 pi r, and this is again equivalent to pi r. So this means that this point is identified with itself. So it's, it's a 
fixed point of the transformation, the fixed point of the D2C method. So there are two fixed points, 0 and pi r. So there are two boundaries of this interval. So now the claim is that you can really, <coughs> I mean, you need to specify now the, the boundary condition for all the field that lives on this orbifold, right? So you need to say, for instance, how the field at minus y is related to the field at y. Maybe I should put also the four-dimensional space-time space -time coordinates, so phi for a scalar field, x and y, or minus y, should be related to the field at y, um, at x and minus y. Okay? So the simplest thing that you can say is simply that that those two fields are equal at point minus y and y, and they would be also equal at phi and x and y plus 2 pi r. Right? That's the simplest <coughs> condition that you can impose that will you know, be um, compatible with this um, translation and z to symmetry, the reflection. <coughs> so now clearly, if you try to <coughs> Uh, for instance, you take one derivative of this field, so you will have the derivative along this extra dimension, so it's a derivative along the y coordinate, phi, and then you want to identify this point, uh, this derivative at the fixed point, so for instance at zero, okay. would be equal to minus, actually, the derivative of the same field, x and zero. Okay. Simply take this relation, take a derivative with respect to y, and evaluate this equation at zero. You will find that the derivative at zero has to be equal to minus the derivative at zero. So this is telling you that this derivative at zero has to vanish. So if the field satisfies this relation, then it means that he has actually um, a Neumann boundary condition. <coughs> Neumann simply means that at the boundary, the derivative of the field dimensional field, it will have a wave function, which is the cos n y of the bar, up to some normalization that can be specified here, so just a normalization factor, plus sum of n phi minus phi plus n sine n y of the bar, and normalization. So what we are saying is that really a Five-dimensional scalar field is actually a, an infinite sum of four-dimensional field. So these are what is called the Kaluza-Klein excitation and the Kaluza-Klein modes. Okay. And then, okay, this mode phi plus certainly satisfies this Neumann boundary condition, while the mode phi minus actually satisfies the Dirichlet boundary. So you have different types of, of, of field, you know, you have some field that satisfies this plus boundary condition, and then the kaluza klein excitation will be really this cosine mode. So this is a plus field, and the minus field will have this other wave function. So you can ask yourself what is a what is the mass of this kaluza klein excitation viewed from the four-dimensional point of view. So, I mean, there is various ways to, to, to look at this, uh, at this mass and look, find the spectrum. As you know, you write explicitly your action in five dimensions. So it's d for x dy, d mu phi, d mu i. And there is also the derivative along the extra dimension. So what is this derivative along the extra dimension? The derivative along the extra dimension is just measuring the derivative of the wave function of the mode. 
and view from a four-dimensional point of view, view from 4D, this will be simply F prime, so this is F, Fn, depends on N, F prime N of Y squared by N squared. So this means that the derivative along the extra dimension is actually generating a mass for the mode in 4D. And this is, yeah, this is nothing else simply than Einstein equation, right? Or Einstein relation that the mass is energy minus the momentum. So you have the momentum in four dimension minus the momentum, let's say, five dimension. Right? The momentum along the fifth dimension. So now, you, know, you can move this P5 on the other side of the, of the equation, and you see that effectively P5 is equivalent to the mass in 4D. So if you're able to generate a momentum along the extra dimension, view from the four-dimensional point of view is exactly like giving a mass to the particle. And at the end of the day, what is a mass? A mass is a form of energy which is not kinematical, not kinetic energy. That's the sum of mass is giving energy without creating motion. So here, you are not creating motion in 4D, you are creating motion in the extra dimension. But since you, as an observer, you are not able to really resolve the momentum along the extra dimension, for you, it will really appear as a mass in 4D. That's it. So here, for this simple compactification, clearly the, uh, the momentum is quantized, so it's quantized by this boundary condition, it's really like doing quantum mechanics in the box. So you have a quantization of the momentum, and you have a mass, mn, which is simply n, an integer, divided by r. So you have an, uh, an infinite tower of kaluza klein excitation, whose mass are simply quantized in units of the inverse of the size of the extra dimension. Yes. Yeah. And the fact that particles have different masses means that they need So you have the, the lowest mode, the massless mode, and then you have all the harmonics of this excitation. So everything is quantized. So, I mean, when you have a strain, you know, it's okay. You have two boundaries, so you attach a string here. You can have a mode like this, or you can have a mode like this. Right? And these are all the, the excitation, all the harmonics of this excitation. Yes. So here we are doing exactly string theory. So that was a, the simplest case, you know, where I basically neglected, neglected all the effect of, uh, of gravity in this uh, extra dimension. So now you can repeat the same kind of exercise in this ADS space. So what you have to do is simply solve the equation of motion in five dimensions. So here, you know, you were giving, you were obtaining the simple um, equation of motion in 5D that were leading to the cosine and sine as the form of the wave function. If you're doing it in this ADS space, you will end up with Bessel function. So the generalization of the sine and cosine in this ADS space are simply Bessel function. So in particular, if you're doing it for, um, for the gauge field, you will find that A mu x and y um, will be a sum over n. We are going to see exactly what, what this quantization is in a moment. It will be a sum of a mu of x, so four-dimensional mode, a n, times f n of z, y is z, a d x x. And this f n, you can see simply by solving the bulk equation of motion, is a sum actually of Bessel function, the thing of order one, m n z plus y j one. Just 
normalization factor. Uh, uh, so just, moment, yes. Uh, a question you have, uh, uh, came to the reverse of the method. So you have put uh, uh, vector fields at the bulk. It looks as if first you have said that only when you propagate at the bulk, and now you have vector fields at the bulk. So yeah, because, I think you, yeah. you should have mentioned that yeah. it's possible to uh, extend uh, yeah. this approach and to let other fields propagate at the bulk. Yes. And this yes. is exactly what we call yeah. universal extra dimension. So universal extra dimension, um, yeah, I mean, so usually you, what you call universal extra dimension is flat extra dimension, except that they won't be very large, so they won't be of the size of one millimeter. Um, they will be at least of a size uh, of one TV. So why one TV? Because you know, if you have the field, the gauge field that propagate into this um, universal extra dimension, you expect some Kaluza-Klein excitation of all the gauge field that are you know, that will have a mass of one over R. So this means that you will expect a W prime, a Z prime, with a mass at least of one over R. And we know that you know we haven't observed a W prime and Z prime at least up to one TV or so. So this means that the size of this extra dimension. Depends a little bit into couplings, but yeah. For real, for real uh, universal so extra dimension. Uh, yeah. right. yes. yes. So this means that really, if all the field propagate into the extra dimension, uh, the size of the extra dimension has to be uh, much smaller than in, in the case that I discussed before, this ADD scenario where only gravity was allowed to propagate. Uh, the situation is slightly different, actually, in ADS space. Um, well, even though at the end of the day, I mean, the size is also one TV. I mean, even though I mean, when when the space is, is curved, you know, you have to be careful about the meaning of, of, of the size. I mean. So here, you will tell me, well, I've introduced, you know, an extra dimension which is large, you know, the order one TV. Uh, inverse, but this is not quite true if you in, if you compute uh, the proper distance, because this is a distance in this funny metric, but Z is not measuring the proper distance because of this wild uh, wild wild warp factor. So the proper distance will be actually one. So you need to take into account the square root of the metric, right? That will be really be measuring the proper distance, and at the end of the day, you will realize that. Even though in the Z coordinate everything is of, of the size of one TV, in the proper distance it will be actually one over n prime. So the proper distance of all, you know, all the proper distance, the proper size that you are introducing are all of the order of the n prime. This is a, uh, the form of the wave function, and now you simply need to impose those boundary conditions to, to solve, uh, to find the spectrum, right? So for the flat, plate, uh, flat case, it was relatively easy because you have only sine and cosine, so you know, you knew automatically, you know, that mn is just an integer. Here, it's a little bit more complicated. You need to solve, for instance, the boundary condition, so you could impose some Neumann, Neumann boundary condition, namely that the gauge, the derivative of the gauge field has to vanish at the two boundaries, so you want to solve uh, the differential equation, which is the um, derivative of the f prime, f prime n at z equal r is equal to f prime n at z equal r prime is equal to zero. And this actually giving is actually giving you um, directly this this quantization equation. So you can check it's just the property of the Bessel function, for instance, that fn prime z is equal to mn z n times I think j0 mn mn z plus bn y0 mn z. So you're just reducing um, the order of the Bessel function and you're multiplying everything that you make in the argument. If I'm not doing any mistake, which should be the case. I should check this. Yes, 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 yes. So you see that this um, boundary condition is simply telling you right, that the derivative has to vanish. Right? So we found that Bm is equal to minus j0 at mn r with y0 mn r. And this 
as all to be equal to the second equation, J0, Mn R prime over Y0, Mn R prime. So now you really have a quantization equation. This admits only solution for a discrete set of value of the masses. Right? So you know you know R, you know R prime, so you can actually solve uh, this equation. What are the value of mn that satisfies this equation? Yeah. What about sine minus? Yes. So that is giving you the quantization equation. You can put it in, in Mathematica, you know, plot with this, this equation, and you'll see that you will cross, uh, cross zero only for discrete value of mn. And at the end of the day, we find that mn r prime, the approximate solution in this case, well, there is first a massless mode, actually, and the next solution is, in this case, is 244 on 556, 8, 69, etc. There is an infinite uh, number of solutions, and again, you have a quantization, and you know the spectrum is quantized in unit of one over r prime. So in principle, you have two scales in your problem. You know, you have the curvature scale r, and you have okay the size of the extra dimension in this unit, which is r prime. And the funny thing is that really the kaluza klein spectrum only depends actually on on the size and doesn't depend on the curvature. So that was the example for the plus plus mode. You know, you can repeat. The same exercise for the plus minus, minus plus, or minus minus, and you will find slightly different spectrum. I mean, those numbers won't be exactly the same, but there will always be number for the one. So that's for a new. So now you have also to worry about the component of the gauge field along the extra dimension, A5. The gauge field uh, in five dimensions has some component along the four-dimensional space-time direction, but it has also a component of A5. Um, so now you will, it's easy to notice that if A mu has an on, on, uh, boundary condition, let's say that is A mu, x, y, z, minus z. So this, now you need to put some gauge index, right? So as from, from the gauge index, a mu, as you need all default projection matrix, a mu, x, and u dagger. Right? This is just to ensure, for instance, that phi, so the fundamental representation, Phi minus z will be transforming as u phi of z. Right? So we discussed previously that u could be plus or minus one. So this is simply when you have already diagonalized this this orbifold projection. Right? You can go into a basis where u is indeed uh, a set of plus one or minus one depending on the gauge direction. But you don't necessarily need to, to, to work in, in, in this direction. So it will be a b. BC A is just a, it is the adjoint index, and I and J are just the, the fundamental representation, right? index in the fundamental representation. So that's the boundary condition for A mu, and by consistency, actually, A5 need to pick up an extra minus sign. A5, same thing as minus Y, minus 
z would be the same thing u a5 z u delta. So why is this extra minus sign? It's simply you have to remember that you need to build the covariant derivative. So a mu goes with d mu minus pi j a mu. Then d5 should go with a5. So you want that these two things transform in the same way when you're performing this orbital projection. And since d5 keep a sign when you change uh, y into minus y, it means that a5 also need to pick this extra minus sign. So that's why you need to introduce this extra minus sign for a5 compared to a mu. So this means that here, if you have a a normal boundary condition for a mu, you will find actually a Dirichlet boundary condition for a5. So the boundary conditions are always uh, opposite for a mu and a5. And what we say here, you know, is that it's only the mode which is plus plus that can have a massless, and only the field that have plus plus boundary condition that can have a massless mode, right? Simply because here, if you have a Dirichlet boundary condition, so if you have a minus boundary condition, the wave function has to vanish. And if you want to have a massless mode, you, know, you need no momentum. So you need a wave function which is flat, which is independent of the coordinate along the extra dimension. And if it fits vanish at one boundary, it will vanish everywhere. So you have no mode. So the only possibility to have a massless mode is to have this plus, this plus boundary condition, this uh, Neumann boundary condition. So this means that here, if you find you know, a plus plus, so if you find a, a massless mode for A5, uh, for A mu, A5 will become massive, and vice versa. If A mu has this minus minus boundary condition, then A5 will have a plus plus boundary condition. So A mu will be A5. So it will be minus minus, minus plus, plus minus, and plus plus. And here you can express, expect a massless mode. Okay. Good. So we are making progress. So we can really understand the spectrum. And what is happening you now to all the massive mode of A5, what the massive mode of A5, they are actually eaten by the Higgs mechanism to become the longitudinal component of the massive mode of, of A mu. Such a way that you are always at each level of the Kaluza Klein excitation, you are always have the same number of degrees of freedom. Okay. So now I think we have more or less all the tools, all the ingredients to really understand ADS CFT for, uh, for model builders, people that are trying to build some, uh, some more phenomenological model. <coughs> So, what we can do, for instance, is to look at the wave function and this normalization of the wave function here. So, this coefficient, so what we want to identify is actually what is the dependence on R and R prime on this normalization factor. So, first of all, let us look at uh, the zero mode. of a mu. So the general mode of a mu, as I said before, means that the wave function is flat. Right? So in this case, f0 is simply a constant. So what is the value of this constant? Well, you, again, you want um, the zero mode to be canonically normalized in, in four dimensions. Right? So you start with your action in 5D for the gauge field, d for x, then square root of the metric g uh, g mu nu g rho sigma f uh, mu rho f mu sigma right? up to canon uh, up to normalization up to one quarter of x. Right? I'm not going to put it here. So now you need to plug this Kaluza Klein decomposition, so A mu x and z is simply A mu of 
x times x0. So in this ADS matrix, this is simply t for x, dz, r of z to the fifth of this determinant, minus 2, minus 2, minus 4, f mu g mu mu g rho sigma eta, eta will be better. The flat metric in 4D, eta mu, eta mu nu, eta mu rho sigma, f zero for this four dimensional field, right? f mu rho zero, f mu sigma zero times f zero squared. L0 is just a constant in this case. Mm -hmm. So now you can perform this integral over this extra dimension. And you will, if you will fix this constant, the normalization constant, by requiring that this integral has to be equal to 1. That's the way you find this normalization condition. So in this case, it's quite simple. You just integral dz r over z f0 squared, which is equal to 1. Okay? And you integrate from z equal r to z equal r prime. Okay? So this is simply r times the log of uh, r prime over r. Okay? f0 squared, which is equal to 1. Find that the zero mode here is simply one of the square root of r times the log of r prime over r. You can check the dimension, everything is correct right? because the gauge field, in fact, dimension has a mass dimension which is um, free half. The, field in, the gauge field in four dimension has a mass dimension which is one, so you need this um, wave function to have the mass dimension um, equal to uh, one half in, in mass unit, which is exactly what you have here. So that's the normalization of the zero mode. Now what about the, uh, the normalization of uh, the massive mode? So in principle, the computation I mean, of the integral is much more complicated. In this case, but here I, I will care only about you know the scaling and the dependence in R and R prime. So that will simplify my life. So the discussion is very similar, right? At the end of the day, you have this normalization condition, which is simply the integral over Z, R over Z times Fn squared, which is now a function of Z, which is equal to 1. And Fn is this complicated sum of best mm -hmm. So what is the property of this Bessel function? Well, Bessel function with an argument here of order one you know, is typically a number of order one. If the argument of the Bessel function is, is very small, actually this will be an exponentially small number. So at the end of the day, you can you convince yourself you know, that when you're doing this integral from r to r prime, the only region that really matters is actually when the argument of the Bessel function is close to 1. So this is close, let's say, to the integral from r prime, z, r over z. And then you can replace you know, the Bessel function by number for the 1. So it will be simply z squared times the normalization function, the normalization factor squared times a number for the one which okay, I don't care. So it's just z squared over z, so it's just z. So you can do this integral very easily, it's just uh, r times squared, r prime, squared, uh, minus, it's only, I mean, you only take the region close to, uh, close to r prime, right? So the other part will give you something which is almost uh, 
punishing you a smaller contribution. M n is equal to n. Okay. So what you found in this case is that n, so this normalization factor, okay, that's something that I wanted to write, that M n x z is equal to A mu of x and this z over n and n in this case is just r prime square root of r okay? times the Bessel function times the Bessel function of order one Bessel function of order one and n Now we can look a little bit at the interaction of all these all these modes. So we have identified uh, the wave function. So we know exactly how this mode looks like along the extra dimension. And clearly, all these modes, all these resonances, will interact with each other. And what we want to identify is actually what is the size of those interactions. So where those interactions are coming from? Well, they are simply coming from the fact that we started with uh, a game theory in five dimension, which is a non-Hamelian game theory. So you have interaction among the five dimensional field, right? which is just dictated by the gate structure. So you have three point interaction and four point interaction. The three point interaction are simply proportional to G5 in Q with a derivative, and you have four-point interaction, g5 squared times a mu to the four, right? Okay? That, that's the structure of this, of this interaction. You have one derivative and three power of the gauge field, two deri uh, zero derivative and four power of the gauge field. That, that's the structure in five. Okay? And again, you have g5, and as usual, you know, because of the kinetic term, it will be R of Z uh, to the fifth minus four. So that will be the structure of those interactions. And now A is really the sum of all this kaluza klein excitation. So first, we can look at the interaction among three zero modes. And this will be the equivalent of the four-dimensional gauge interaction. So you have a, uh, a gauge theory in 4D with massless mode, with a massless uh, gauge boson, and the interaction among three of those massless modes is just what is interpreted as a four-dimensional gauge coupling. So for G4D is just G5D times the integral of a DZ R over Z times the third power of the wave function of the massless mode, F0Q. Okay? Is it clear? So let us do this integral. So it's G5D, integral DZ, R over Z, and then you have just a constant, which is R times the log of R prime of R to the power of three R. Okay, so that's an easy integral again. So this is just a constant. So this is just R again, log of R prime on the R. So at the end of the day, you obtain that G4D is G5D divided by r log of r prime over r. And again, you can check that dimensionally this is correct. Right? Look at the mass dimension of a gauge coupling in 4D, which is dimensionless. The gauge coupling in 5D has a dimension. This dimension is in quantity. And then this, this dimension of of the gauge coupling in 5D is compensating by this extra power of the, of the, of the size of 
inside of this resolution. So that really is a gauge coupling among uh, the massless mode. So now you can check the interaction among three resonances. So you have all this excitation, you know, all this Kaluza Klein excitation, whose mass are given by this quantity divided by one over r prime. And you want to interpret those resonances as, for instance, resonances of the strong <coughs> theory. Right. It will be, for instance, all this excitation of QCD. So you want to compute what is the strength of the interaction among those resonances. So that will be the equivalent of zero of, of QCD. And again, I mean, those interactions originate from the same gauge interaction in, in, in five dimensions. So it would be again G5D, DZ, R over Z. But now you have to use actually the wave function of this kaluza clan excitation and not the wave function of the zero mode. So it will be Fn cubed. And what we have seen is that Fn has a slightly different normalization compared to the zero mode. Right? There is no log suppression, for example. The massless more than this log suppression, which is not present for the massive uh, Kaluza Klein excitation. Okay, so let us do that. This is simply ZQ. Okay. Um, a Bessel function, again, you know, when you are doing the integral, everything will be dominated by the region close to the infrared brain. So we can replace you know, this Bessel function by number for the one. Okay, so this I don't care. So it would be R prime square root of R to the cube. So let's do this integral. So it's Z cube divided by Z. So it's Z squared. Integral okay, dz of times z squared is simply r prime cube, right? So r prime cube actually here comes from this r prime cube in the denominator. So at the end of the day, we get g5d uh, divided by square root of r. r in the numerator, r the power of 3 half in the data. So now we see some strong interaction appearing, right? So we see that the massless mode is 1 over square root of log suppressed compared to the interaction among all the kaluza Klein excitation. And we know that, so you have resonances, you know, m rho, of order one of r prime, and this is by QCD analogies. This is supposed to be zero times f rho, which is okay, the equivalent of a pi on the scale of the strong interaction. So now we are we starting to really see the matching between this five-dimensional theory and the four-dimensional strongly interacting theory. And I'm doing the matching. I'm really relating uh, the quantity on both sides of this uh, identification. That F rho in this case, so we know G rho, we know M rho, so we conclude that F rho is equal to 1 over R prime square root of R divided by G5. So the next thing that I want to discuss is actually what are the symmetry properties of this four-dimensional strongly interacting theory. And we will do one uh, final check to see that everything is actually consistent and that really supporting this uh, ADS-CFT correspondence between this five-dimensional theory and this four-dimensional uh, strongly interacting theory. So notice that all, you know, all this particular behavior, you know, the fact that zero is much larger than G4D, the four-dimensional gauge interaction, 
is only a consequence of the particular shape of the wave function. Right? The fact that you have this exponentially small wave function close to the infrared brain that all the kind of the climate excitation are really localized, the wave function are peaked close to the infrared brain. If you do the same computation in flat space, this wouldn't be the case at all. Right? The wave function of this sine and cosine, so they really leave and explore the full extra dimension with the same strength. Because on sine is not localized in any point along this extra dimension. The peculiarity of this ADS space is really the localization property of all these wave functions. The localization property of this Bessel function that are exponentially suppressed close to the plant, close to the, to the UV brain, to the UV boundary. Okay. Um, yeah, so here. What is the symmetry in 5D, right? So I have a gauge group, a gauge group in 5 dimensional G, and you simply impose some boundary condition on the two endpoints of this boundary. So you have the UV boundary, the plant boundary, plant brain, infrared boundary. And you know, you don't have to impose the same uh, Neumann boundary condition for all the gauge directions. So you could can select actually some of the gauge direction to have bond, uh, Neumann boundary condition and some other that will have Neumann uh, Dirichlet boundary condition. So at the end of the day, I will impose and we break G down to a subgroup A0 by saying that the gauge direction that belong to the subgroup A0 have a boundary condition plus on this UV brain and the other, so G divided by A0, will have a Dirichlet boundary condition. And I told you it's only the plus boundary condition that have a zero root. So the only mode, the only gauge direction of G that will have a zero mode, need actually to have a plus boundary condition. And here the same thing on the infrared boundary condition, you can break it to another subgroup, H1. So again, H1 will have a Dirichlet boundary condition a uh, Neumann boundary condition plus, and G divided by H1 will have a minus boundary condition. So now you can really find the spectrum, right? You have everything which is characterized. You have field which has plus, plus, field which are plus, minus, minus, plus, or minus, minus, right? So what are the field now? What are the gauge direction that have a massless mode in 4D? Well, there are the field uh, that are really leading in the intersection between H0 and H1. This will have the plus plus boundary condition, so here it's plus plus. H0 will, in the uh, complement of H0 in H is simply plus minus, minus plus, and the other is minus minus. Right? Is it clear? Is this second clear? So the claim is that in four dimension, view from the four dimensional point of view, you will have a symmetry that corresponds to H. So this is the only mode that have a massless, uh, a massless mode. The right? only gauge direction which should have a massless mode. So here, you know, in this four dimension, di dimensional side, means that I will have some global symmetry G with a subgroup H, which is weakly gauge. So they have a global symmetry G. And H, the intersection of H0 and H1, is a weakly gauge subgroup of G. Weakly gauge subgroup. Surviving unbroken, uh, unbroken, weakly gauge, unbroken subgroup. And actually, H naught will be a weakly gauge, potentially broken subgroup. 
and then the intersection of the complement, so H not over uh, H, actually correspond to a, uh, um, a spontaneously broken gauge group, spontaneously broken, spontaneously broken gauge symmetry. Why, how do I see that it's spontaneously broken? So this corresponds to the mode which is plus minus. And in addition, so that's something that okay, you will do in the exercise maybe. So for the plus minus mode, for the plus minus mode, in addition to this regular Kaluza Klein excitation that are quantized in unit of one of R prime, there is actually one light mode, an additional light mode with a mass. So that's only present for the plus minus boundary condition, again, due to the extension of the Bessel function, you can find the solution uh, with a mass, which is 1 over R prime, but this is also not suppressed. This is the, the law, the square root of the law. Plus minus, one light mode, yes. So that's only present for this plus minus boundary condition. And I want to say that this corresponds exactly to this spontaneously broken gauge group. And how can we check that? So if it's spontaneously broken, what is the mass that you're expecting for those particles? Spontaneously broken, right? So it's exactly like the W of the Z, spontaneous breaking of the gauge symmetry. And we expect the mass of this particle here to be of the order of the gauge coupling times the dynamical scale, times G over this scale. Okay? That's what you expect from a usual X mechanism, which is a spontaneous breaking of the gauge symmetry. So now, you have to check that indeed, this expectation for the masses of the particle agrees with the five-dimensional computation, which is this one. Okay. And that's really a non-trivial non result. G for D, okay, where is G for D? So G 5D divided by square root of R times the log of R prime over R. Okay. F4, put it here, is 1 over R prime, square root of R divided by G 5D. G 5D cancel, R cancel, and you end up with 1 over R prime square root of the log of R of R, which is exactly the result of the five-dimensional computation. This exists. So you really have this nice interpretation. So you have um, a global symmetry with um, a subgroup H0, which is weakly gauge. This subgroup H0 is spontaneously broken to a subgroup H, which is the intersection of H0 and H1. You can call, for instance, the, uh, the number of expected uh, ghost on boson in this case, right? So, let's say, what are the number of ghost on boson that you have in your theory? So you have a global symmetry G, right, which is broken onto H. You expect, let's say, the dimension of G minus the dimension of H as a number of ghost on bosons. So here I'm counting the number of ghost on bosons, pseudo number of ghost on bosons. But now some of these ghost on bosons are actually eaten by the fact um, by the fact that you have a, um, a part of this global symmetry which is weakly gauge and this weakly gauge subgroup is actually spontaneously broken to a subgroup. So you have H0, uh, which is broken down to H. So here you are expecting actually, um, you have 
a number of, um, of gauge bosons that acquire a, a, a longitudinal component that acquire a mass. So you need to subtract so the E, some, some ghost of boson, and the dimension is dimension of H0 uh, minus the dimension of H. And at the end of the day, you can check that this is exactly equal to the number of minus minus boundary condition. This is the dimension, is the dimension of G minus <coughs> the dimension of H0 minus the dimension of H1 plus the dimension of H. And this, so the minus minus boundary condition, you know, as I say, we'll have a massless mode for A5. So this goes from boson that you see in this four-dimensional picture exactly corresponds to the massless mode that are contained in A5. So we have done exactly the perfect matching between this five-dimensional series with a full spectrum, all this interaction, and this particular four-dimensional uh, series with this uh, with this symmetry structure and this, uh, this interaction. And we have done the matching between you know, the physical quantity on the two sides of the description. Okay, so now to conclude, I will simply give you some examples. So this is the general description, and I want to give you some physical examples, some models that you can build out of this ADS space, by simply uh, choosing appropriately your boundary condition. Okay? Is there any questions there? We have derived really ADS CFT from a phenomenological point of view, right? Just by doing some simple integral of Bessel wave function. Mm -hmm. So you don't need any equal force if it's symmetry or anything. It's only yes. So there is one thing that I didn't discuss at all, is actually what are the, um, the modes, the excitation of the graviton. So I start with the graviton in five dimensions. This view from the four dimensional point of view actually contains you know, more than the graviton. So you have additional modes. And if here, if you're doing this simply this compactification, you know, without introducing any other dynamics, you will find that actually the graviton in 5D contain, contains a massless scalar field in 4D. So you will have the graviton plus uh, a massless scalar field. And this is called the radion. And the radion is actually controlling, let's say, the fluctuation of the size of this extra dimension. And indeed, if I don't add any extra dynamics, this radion will be massless. So this massless mode will mediate the fifth-fourth interaction, which is incompatible with what we know from experiments. So you need to introduce some stabilization mechanism to make sh sure that the size of this extra dimension doesn't fluctuate. So that's another extra complication. I think I've already lost you in this computation, so if I introduce this stabilization, uh, you will leave and we'll go for lunch in a bit. <laughs> so here I'm really looking at particle physics, you know, so I, I decouple gravity and, and neglect to pause this out. Maybe you will mention that in your lecture. But I think it, 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 it is important to measure it from the lower beginning. Yes, that's true, yes, to make the connection. Okay, so I can simply give you two nice examples. Um, so we start, let's say, with SO5 as a gauge symmetry in 5D, we'll break it down to SU2 cross U1 on this UV boundary. And U1 different charge, it's a subgroup of it, it's a subgroup of this plus U1 X. So the interpretation is that, okay, I, have a, I will have a global symmetry which is SO5, and out of this global symmetry there will be a subgroup 
which is unbroken subgroup of the UV brain, which is gauge. So that corresponds, of course, to the gauge group of the standard model. So where are we on it? <laughs> X is localized here, and so we see that, I mean, in order to solve the ERG problem, you need the, the UV infrared scale and the width scale to be close to this one. <coughs> on the other side, I will break SO5 to SO4. And this corresponds to SO4 plus C1. And again, this correspond to a spontaneous breaking of the global symmetry. So you can check in this case, I mean again by counting the massless mode in A5, etc., that this exactly corresponds to this uh, minimal compositics model that we were discussing yesterday. Minimal compositics model, which has the global symmetry SO5 broken to SO4. That exactly produces four boson boson, and this four boson boson are the massless mode that have this, that are contained in A5 uh, associated to this minus minus model of condition. If you apply this formula, okay, uh, dimension of G, okay, neglect, okay, we can neglect this U1 for a moment for the quantity that doesn't matter. Okay. Dimension of G is 10, so 5. Main dimension of H0, which is this one, is minus 3 and 4. Um, dimension of H1 is uh, 6, plus the dimension of H. Um, it should be here. H, so what is the intersection between H2 and H1 hypercharge? Intersection of SO5, well, actually, it is exactly this UV. This is a subgroup of SO5. So H, this, this intersection actually H is identical to, uh, to H0. So this exactly gives you this four most of boson that we are expecting in, in, in the four-dimensional side, right? just by the breaking of the global symmetry. <coughs> so here you have really massless mode that are contained in A5. And actually, if you look at the profile of the wave function, this A5 will be localized to this matter. So uh, the X is close to the, to the infrared brain. So this A5 are identified with, with X doublet. Okay? So that's really a minimal composite X model. You can go more extreme and write the, the dual of technical order. You start with SU to left plus SU to right plus U1 D minus 7 in this case. You break it down to SU to left plus U1 hypercharge on the UV brain. You break it here to SU to diagonal plus U1 D minus 7. So what is intersection of the unbroken group on the UV and infrared? Well, it's simply a, a, a single U1 which is contained um, in those group, and this is only U1 of electromagnetism. So there is a single U1 that survives this boundary condition. All the other gauge direction are broken, so all, they all acquire mass. So the W and the Z, in this case, acquire mass simply because the momentum, their momentum is quantized along the extra dimension. So the W and Z don't acquire the mass via the wave of the X field, they acquire the mass simply because they acquire a momentum along the extra dimension due to the boundary condition that you are imposing. And yes, I mean, you can again check this formula and you will find that this is exactly equal to zero. So in this case, there is no ghost on boson at all. The dimension, uh, the dimension of the space is minus minus boundary condition is equal to zero. So you have no ghost on boson, you have no, uh, no x boson at all in this, in, in, in this model. So this is really x less. So this is a five dimensional description of a model break electric symmetry without the X boson at all. X less or technical. Okay? And just in order 
about WNZ bosons? So the know? WNZ boson, you will notice that actually they will correspond exactly to this uh, plus minus mode that I was describing. So they were anomalously light mode, you know, with this boundary condition plus or minus that really correspond to this spontaneously broken gauge symmetry that we discussed, right? And you can check that this actually exactly corresponds to the WNZ. Mm -hmm. But in this theory, they don't appear because we have zero. So there is no, I mean, there is no gauge field that have a massless mode except the photons. But you have three gauge modes that are anomalously light in unit of one over r prime. They are light because of this uh, square root of flux suppression. Mm -hmm. So the spectrum we will find is it something which is the W and Z, you know, at a mass of the order of 100 GV. And then you have all the Kaluzak line excitation, W prime, Z prime. Actually, you have a little bit more because the gauge group is larger than the SU2 plus U1 this type of quantum numbers, and this will be pushed you know, to 1 over r prime, and then there is this log, uh, square root of log enhancement between those two steps. So this is a spontaneous broken symmetry done by the strong dynamics, and all the other are just the excitation of the strong, uh, of the resonances of the strong sector. Of course, I mean, now you can you know, try to put fermions, so I didn't discuss at all how to include fermion into this extra dimension. You can put them, you can compute you know, the, uh, the interaction of the W and the Z with the fermion, with the quark on the left hand, etc. So you can do all the phenomenology. You can look at how this W prime and Z prime, and also here, how the W prime and Z prime will decay into fermions, etc. So there is a rich phenomenology associated to those models. Any questions? I've been very fast, but okay. The rest is just some tedious computation. You, know. you can spend the rest of your life you know, computing this very great care all these numerical factors. So here, so all the numerical factors of order one to exactly what you want. There will be some number for the one that are not one. It could be five, five point five, five point three, whatever. So this scenario, someone draw. Yes, because the Higgs has been observed. Right? This one is still alive, right? Yes, yes. Absolutely. And what, what are crucial predictions for this scenario? Uh, the crucial predictions... Yeah, so, yes, yes. so now if you try to amend you know, the fermion and use this picture, you will have also resonances of the top, etc. That the top partner that we discussed, you know, that are completing the representation of SO5, but how about gauge bosons? You have also some excitation of the gauge bosons. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 You have W prime. You prime and Z prime. You have no, um, you have no um, massive excitation of the X because this has A5. And I say that the massive mode of A5 are eaten to become the longitudinal component of A mu. Yeah, but by counting the number of degrees of freedom. But you have, yeah, but you but expect some W prime and Z prime. You, you have some addition, right? Spin one, not spin zero. Not spin, yeah, spin zero. Not spin zero, only spin one. So the only spin zero that you expect are really this uh, X doublet. Nothing else. Uh, so and, and doublet, because you, you put a really doublet by hand yeah. in the beginning, right? Well, no, it didn't put a doublet. The doublet emerged from the symmetry breaking, right? Simply because I have this of I mean, how would distinguish left and right? Oh, because you here is a broken down to SU to left, something that I identified with the so left and the gauge symmetry. Okay. Um, so yeah. So what do you expect in, in practice? I mean usually if you put the fermion you will see that the Kaluza clan excitation of the top is actually lighter than the double prime and Z prime. So that's the first particle that you really expect to see <coughs> in this type of model. I don't know, I wanted to discuss relaxion, but it seems uh, time is gone. Yeah. <laughs>
So, uh, maybe some other questions, otherwise uh, you are in a bit uh, hurry. Yeah. So, uh, let's thank Christopher for Thanks so much. And good luck for your studies. Also. <laughs> Hopefully in a few years I will learn from you. <laughs> That's the purpose of the schools. The teacher is uh, teaching something to the students and then a few years later the students are, teach are teaching the teachers.